Hello, I'm David Uy, Executive Director of the Chinese American Museum DC, the first and only museum in our nation's capital dedicated to the Chinese American story. In today's program, we discuss an important part of American history, Chinese American service to this country in the US military and the home front. Not only are many people unaware of the depth of that service, most are surprised to learn that Chinese have been defending this country since the Civil War. This program is brought to you by the Chinese American Museum in Washington, DC, and the Chinese American GI Project in San Francisco. Together, we've been working on the beginnings of our museum's permanent exhibit, Service to Country, uh, for about a year now, uh, and partially through the pandemic. And uh, we look forward to this exhibit, uh, this program, and more programs like this in the near future. So we are pleased to welcome one of the foremost experts on the subject, um, Montgomery Hom, who's the founder and executive producer of the Chinese American GI Project. Uh, he's an independent filmmaker, uh, a production and historical military specialist and author. He is also the 2022 NEH grant recipient for the project Dialogues on the Experiences of War. Connie Yu is a fourth generation Californian, an author, historian, and board member emeritus of the Chinese Historical Society of America. She is the author of Chinatown, San Jose, USA, and co-editor of Voices from the Railroad, Stories of the Descendants of Chinese Railroad Workers. She is also a co-producer of the exhibit called To Rise, Chinese Americans in CBI. And last but not least, William Wong is a retired New York City police sergeant with over 21 years of combined service to New York City and New York State. Uh, prior to the NYPD, he served as a police officer in the San Francisco Police Department. In his military capacity, uh, he was served, he has served over 34 years enlisted and commissioned service in the United States Army Reserve with the current rank of Lieutenant Colonel. He is a combat veteran of Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, there is way too much to discuss in one program. So we thought that we would approach this by telling some representative stories across the entire history. So it's plan on it being a whirlwind tour. So um, Monty, why don't you get us uh, started off by uh, giving us some context for Chinese Americans role in this history. Thanks, David. Thanks for the introduction. And good evening, everyone. Thanks for being with us. So as you know, some, some of you know my work. Uh, I've been at this game for a very long time. And the context of what I've always been interested in is, of course, our Chinese Americans in the military service. So one of the first who served our country, uh, although he was not the only one, but he's a very, very important individual because he served over 30 years of service to this country from the Civil War, 1861 to 1860, 1895, excuse me, uh, at the time when he retired. He fought through the entire Civil War period, and that was none other than Edward de Cahota. And he's sort of our poster boy because his particular service to this country has gone unrecognized. And the fact that he served longer than most individuals, uh, even high-ranking officers, is a bit of a travesty. And one of the things that I learned about uh, researching him from his descendants is that when he retired, he was told that he could not be a citizen because of the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. And he didn't know anything about that, obviously. But the fact that he still raised the flag, lowered the flag every single day, rain or shine, until nearly his death uh, at the age of 96, uh, in his heart, he was an American, right? 
Uh, he was never, never deterred by the fact that the government told him, uh, sorry, you're not a citizen. But yes, we'll give you a pension. Yes, we'll give you your civil war pension even. But we cannot give you his, your citizenship. But, and, and he fought this for 30 years after he retired. Um, you know, he, he hired lawyers, he had an affidavit, he went after the government. And obviously, he was never, ever recognized for his service to America. So um, we hope that in the future, through one of my projects that I'm finishing right now, which would be Chinese in the Civil War, the story about the men who fought on both sides, that we could recognize Kahoda. And so this was definitely uh, something very worthwhile for one of our missions. Uh, as, we, as we move forward, Chinese Americans also uh, participated in the Spanish-American War. And they were actually on board every single ship in the Battle of Manila Bay, uh, Admiral Dewey's great white fleet that fought the Spaniards in 1900. And uh, it's incredible to know that e every ship had Chinese crewmen, including Admiral Dewey's ship, uh, which was the USS Olympia. And he had personal um, servants, but at the same time, many of these men that served aboard the ship became battle ready and they were able seamen as they were called. Um, so as we move forward, we're going to the first world war. And this is the first time where we see a larger component of Chinese in American service because Chinese were also drafted for the first time during world war one. And one of the most illustrious uh, individuals is Sergeant Lao Sing Ki. He hails from California, born in Saratoga, uh, in the San Jose area. And basically, he ends up being in the 77th Infantry Division in World War I. And he becomes our nation's highest decorated individual, winning the Distinguished Service Cross. As you see the photo, he comes home uh, in a proud, proud parade in San Jose with his mother and father. And he's also uh, decorated with the French Croix de Guerre. Now, his actions have not gone unnoticed. And I will, I'm very happy to announce that um, the military, in a special program, uh, along with the Army and the Historical Division, will probably be upgrading Sergeant Lao Sing Ki to the Congressional Medal of Honor within the next year. So that's going to be very, very exciting to, to have the nation's first Chinese American hero and be honored with that great, great, uh, you know, uh, uh, Congressional Medal of Honor. I mean, that is awesome for his family, for the Chinese American community, for the history of the United States Army, for its diversity. Now, as we move forward, we have a lull and we start getting into the 1930s, right? The 1930s period, uh, many of you know, we faced a, a pretty dangerous situation in China when the Japanese attacked Manchuria, uh, Manchuria in 1931. So when the Japanese forces came into China, um, there was a big problem because the Chinese did not have a modern military to stop the mighty Japanese. The Japanese had very modern Air Force, Navy, uh, Marines. I mean, they were a juggernaut. And so the Chinese community in America took this at heart and it was very, very serious because many of our families here had family in China. So there was this situation where they thought about how, how do we help? What, what can we do? And the most important thing that they started to do in the Chinese American communities between New York City, Chicago, all the way to Portland, Seattle, San Francisco was to help the Chinese war relief and raise money. Um, we also did many protests, as you could see, early activism with the Chinese American community to basically say no scrap iron sales to Japan. Uh, unfortunately, this went a little bit unheeded with the American government with uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was president at that time. And the Chinese basically had to go on their own to say, what can we do? How can we do this? And that was the primary concern of our Chinese American community was to how can we protect the lives of our family members and other Chinese in China? Raise money through rice bowl drives, raise money for the China war relief. And as you can see in the photos, 
Chinatown um, was very, very active in basically doing this across the nation. Much money was raised. And then the money that was raised went to help raise a Chinese American fighter squadron out of San Francisco, as well as Seattle, out of Portland. And these were our first Chinese American volunteers that went into the Chinese Air Force to help fight the Japanese forces. And I believe Connie, I remember talking to you about this because during the 1930s, this is a time when you were growing up. Uh, as you can see here, this is one of our Chinese American pilots. And this is Archie Lee. He's from San Jose. And as a Chinese American fighter pilot, this guy is very, very interesting. And the reason for that is, is because he went into the Chinese Air Force in the late 1930s, saw combat, but then he actually came back to the United States and he joined the United States Army Air Corps to become a dual wing holder, meaning that he had the Chinese wings and he had a set of United States Army Air Force wings. And now he stays into service and he fought uh, all the way until the end of the war. And he did not come home for about five years. Uh, I have the pleasure of interviewing him and obviously uh, holding some of the last artifacts that belong to him. But I also wanted to go to uh, Connie to discuss this, the sentiments, the feeling of the Chinese community in the 1930s and how that kind of primed us and mobilized us as a community at, uh, at large, right, across the nation. So I'd, I'd love to kind of have Connie uh, give us a little bit of a backdrop because her family also was directly involved. Oh, definitely. My, um, my father and my uncle, um, my uncle was born in 1910, and we always say a year before the Chinese Revolution because they were born, and my father was born in 1912, and uh, their father was a revolutionary. They, they were born in San Jose in a Chinatown called Heinlandville. There's a big uh, story about that. We won't go into it, but uh, my, the Chinatown before that was called the Market Street Chinatown. And that's where my grandfather came at the, the age of 11, one year before the exclusion law. So in our family, we were always told, you know, we're so fortunate that grandpa came, um, that's, a, that's a later slide, but you know, it, it gives this sentiment. Anyway, grandfather came one year before the exclusion law, that's why we're here. So this whole, the, the specter of the ex exclusion law was always upon us. My grandfather and grandmother were not allowed to be citizens, but their kids grew up, they were born in San Jose, grew up very, very patriotic. They were inspired by Sing K Sergeant Singh came, they went to the, um, the train station to meet him when he came home. And they were so inspired because he, he was awarded a, a, the Distinguished Service Cross for extraordinary heroism in France. Like this is a big world out there. And Singh K was there. But, the, the, but soon as they were growing up, they're, they're, of course their eyes were turned to China because the, their parents were so involved with the, with, uh, sending uh, the relief efforts because China by 1931 uh, was already um, fighting uh, Japan. So my my uncle grew up wanting to be a pilot. He was going to be a pilot. He he went to actually training school, pilot training school in Texas. But at that time, the discrimination was so great. I mean, there was no chance for him to become a a a, a, a pilot for um, uh, for the U.S army and uh, commission officer, that all changed soon. But at that time, he said, I, I'm going to go to fight. I'm going to go to, um, he went overseas to join the, to uh, join the fledgling Chinese Air Force. And you can imagine what the planes were like. And so he was training pilots. Um, and in 19, in the spring of 1937, he was on a reconnaissance mission and his plane crashed into a mountain uh, 30 miles outside of Canton. And so the news came to my grandparents. They were just so devastated. Um, and my, my father, he took up the mantle. He, he went to Stanford, joined ROTC, 
And you see, they call him Chinese boy, brother of dead flyer wins army commission. This is a US army commission. He was commissioned a second lieutenant. So um, he uh, went to ROTC, he trained and um, uh, let's see, uh, that's another slide. I have another slide about, anyway, so he and my mother got married in 1937 um, and uh, he continued to work. Um, he worked as a, a, an engineer and it was very difficult for Chinese to be engineers at that time. It's kind of hard to believe, but anyway, um, to make a long story short, um, uh, my sister was born in 1938. I was born in 1941, um, the year of Pearl Harbor. And um, we were in Whittier, California. And my father was working uh, as an engineer and for petroleum engineer. And he knew that he was going to be called up. He was in the army reserve. So he, you know, volunteered. He, was, he just, before he was called up and, um, here he is, the only surviving son, and he said, I want to go, I want to serve. This was, this was like his destiny. And there was this will to fight, our whole family. I mean, I wasn't there, I couldn't be aware of it, but I could always, you know, I seem to have inherited, inherited this feeling of intense uh, feeling of, of patriotism and the need to sacrifice. And so uh, my father uh, went overseas, and he was overseas for 31 months in CBI. So I have some slides about the home front. David, I have a picture of my dad um, and it's, uh, he sends it to my mother and uh, to my darling wife and he's promoted to uh, first lieutenant. And, and then um, he was um, in air dropping in, uh, in India and then he went to uh, Kunming as a combat ordnance officer. And there he is. So, so this is the home front. You know, this, you know, my mother would be always, I just remember her crying and then reading letters from my dad and then she would be writing letters to him. So, um, and then here's the, his, this is her keepsake picture. And then I have one from her. Yeah, this is the one my, uh, my dad carried, there I am uh, as a baby. And there's my sister, three years older. And there we are, 244 North Comstock Street in Whittier, California. My mother had a, we were the only Chinese family in this town, believe it or not. And my mother had a, a, a gift shop called um, the Ch Young's Chinese Gift Shop. And she also uh, was part of raising funds for the rice bowl and, um, and supporting the war effort. But mainly, you know, she was writing letters to my dad. And um, I'd like to show you a picture of the mail call, which is so important. Um, my father said, oh, everybody wanted us to, to go on mail call. You just never want to miss it. So this is a picture of my dad as a, he's, he's promoted to captain and, and he's with Captain um, uh, James T. Barnes. And this is a kind of a, one of those uh, propaganda pictures, okay, that, that, that would come to the hometown papers and the caption would be, keep those letters coming. So it was very inspiring. I mean, to think for the Chinese Americans to see that here's, here's a Chinese captain with a Caucasian captain and they're both of the same rank and they have CBI, China, Burma, India patch. And they're sitting in a Jeep and the, it's somewhere in China, because they could never tell. There's my dad holding, well, it's a pose picture, but it's a letter from my mom. So next. And then um, my mom, so here's the thing. My mother was supporting the war effort and also there were visitors from China and there was a contingent of Air Force cadets from the Chinese Air Force training in Arizona. And she and my grandparents hosted the, uh, the, the cadets and, and had a banquet for them in, in uh, Los Angeles and took, they, I remember going on picnics with them. 
So here's my mother in her best, you know, Chinese outfit posing. And she made the mistake of sending this photograph to my dad. My dad writes a letter saying, I don't want to see any pictures like this. I don't want to see a picture with you, these other men. Only picture, send me pictures of you and the children and my parents. So, okay. Next, I think my mother uh, sent a, a much more, okay, this is a morale picture my mother sends to him. This is my sister and me. We're posing in front of the front door and there's a banner there that has a V and the V stands for, of course, victory. But this banner was on, um, indicated that this family has someone serving overseas. And my dad, you know, he didn't know how long he'd be gone. You know, we, we took a lot of uh, portraits uh, beforehand um, and, you know, thing. And he, all, and he wrote my mother, I will be home. I will be, you know, I will come back. It was 31 months before he came over on rotation. Okay. Next, I have an, okay. And then here's a, a photograph of uh, my dad. Uh, I think this is a signal corps photograph. And he's, uh, you can see he's the only non-white person there. And there's a CBI patch and he's promoted to major. And this is uh, the, the US Army Ordnance Unit that was at the Battle of Shongsan. And my dad being an engineer was part of the team that designed the, uh, the charges that blew up uh, Mount Sung. And that, I mean, the Chinese had tunneled, Chinese army people had tunneled so that this would be possible. And it blew up the mountain where the, the Chinese, Japanese were lodged and it, it opened up the Burma road. So that was a critical battle. And I think it was, uh, my father had a diary and he, he kept very detailed, um, you know, uh, notes about what transpired during the day. During this battle over, over a couple months, there was just blank pages. And at the very last one was uh, of, of this battle was, the road is open, it is free. And uh, here's a picture my mother sends to him. And my father had sent the, the words in Chinese and English for the, the, the Chinese anthem called Qi Lai, meaning, you know, call to rise, rise up. and and. I'm doing the victory sign. So my dad was very happy with this photograph. And we also had a victory garden. The, the whole community was mobilized everywhere. Um, so, um, and I also wanted to say, there's a photograph of my, my mother with, my, with her two brothers and uh, Fred, Fred Lee and Lai Lee, they enlisted and they were, um, stationed in Columbus, Ohio. And my grandmother wanted to say goodbye to them. My mother, you know, went to San Francisco to take my grandmother to see them and to see them off. And the article, it was, it was kind of amazing. I mean, the, this is in the Midwest. There were very few Chinese. And so they were identified as Chinese cadets, not, you know, US army cadets. And, uh, but they said Chinese cadets here in Ohio, eager to fight. So the atmosphere that I just wanted to convey was that everybody had this feeling. I mean, uh, in Chinatown, certainly, but Chinatown was an enclosed community. They had the, the fundraising, the rice bowl, um, and then they had the Forbidden City, which was the nightclub that the soldiers would go to before my father, before he shipped out, went to the Forbidden City. This is part of the the morale, you know, everybody was in support and, and to build up their spirits that they were, they, were, um, they were dedicated, sacrificing soldiers and everybody, their whole community, family, everybody was behind them. And that the women, we were so inspired by, uh, like my, one of my aunts was a, a Lonnie, Yee, Lonnie Yee Young, was a, a Rosie the Riveter only was, she was a phalanger at the Marin shipyards and all these, it gave us great pride. And there are a lot of women in um, the civil defense. And it was just a, a, a very inspiring period. For, for, for me, just the sight of a uniform inspired me as a little child. There's, there's mm -hmm. Auntie Lonnie looking great. So, <laughs> all right.
Connie, that, you know, to put it in context for our audience, Chinatown was a really busy place, whether you were in San Francisco, whether you were in New York City, Chicago, all the Chinatowns were so busy. They were patriotic. They, they ran the uh, fundraising for the China, China War Relief. They also raised money for war bonds, right? For U.S. war bonds to support the U.S. war industry as well. And, you know, obviously San Francisco's Chinatown, we had the largest Chinese population. And we had also, for example, the only Chinatown USO, for example. And so, again, to put it in context, the Chinese in Chinatown were active. You know, we, we did our thing. We supported America. We supported the war effort. And I, I also wanted to kind of take this on a little side journey to also talk about, you know, we're, we're, <clears throat> we're here for the first time discussing, you know, as, as you know, Connie, the women participation, right? For example, um, these volunteer women, the American uh, Women's Volunteer uh, Services, this was in Los Angeles, for example. AWACS was in Los Angeles, but they also had a chapter in New York City. Okay, they were quite active, and these women bought their own uniforms, and they they were very serious about you know engaging yeah. during the war effort. It's 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 amazing, right? Um, that the Chinese American women stepped up in large numbers and supported the war effort when we needed them, when America needed them. And Monty, um, how, in, in, in the surrounding, like, say, San Francisco area, how aware mm -hmm. was the greater community about the level of participation, um, uh, you know, of the local Chinese? I, I think it was huge because talking to, you know, my own family members and talking to veterans at that time period mm -hmm. who may have not entered service yet because they, they were a little young, for example, you know, they may have entered service in 44, but the fact that the Chinese American community was so, um, the women especially were so engaged during the war effort, it was incredible. I mean, as you see here, this is a very rare picture uh, from my archive on the Chinese women's canteen. And this was the first, uh, right, right before the USO, they did a canteen to serve Chinese Americans because Chinese Americans were not allowed to the USO. And this actually infuriated the director who banded all these young women together to say, hey, we have to support our boys. We've got to do something. And so thus the Chinese uh, American uh, women started the Chinese canteen, which became the Chinatown USO, which was officially recognized in 1944. So, so yes, uh, Chinese Americans were obviously so involved in the home front uh, from war industry work, you know, to the fundraising. But then, of course, you know, the the main thing is that they're supporting is they always say we're supporting our boys there. And obviously for this Veterans Day, um, I, I say with a heavy heart um, that one of our very beloved Chinese American veterans has just passed. And... Uh, I think if some of you had read the post recently that I put on our, our Chinese American GI project site on Facebook, uh, this is, of course, no other than Randall Ching, Private First Class Randall Ching was the Chinese American Ranger, the only one serving in the European Theater of Operations. He was on D-Day. He fought from D-Day all the way to the end of the war, um, basically without relief. And uh, amazingly, he was not wounded in combat. But he saw so much combat that reading his citation papers for his bronze stars, I have never heard that he would have received two citations that said that he single-handedly destroyed the enemy forces in hand-to-hand -hand combat with a knife. This is him during our uh, rededication of the Chinatown St. Mary Square Memorial that we did right before COVID. And this was the first time that I was able to bring out uh, Mr. Ching to the public because for over 85 years, nobody knew who this guy was. He was completely under the radar uh, in the Chinatown community. Um, he had not talked about it. 
He was not a member of the uh, American Legion or the VFW. Um, he was living a very, very quiet life. And yet which he is not, a, which is not atypical of a lot of people of that, that generation. That absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Because he he was a he is such a humble individual that he just did not want to talk about it. And uh, it, it, it took a while for myself and his family to allow me to really enter his life and interview him. But we became very close friends. And um, I have to say that we've really lost an amazing Chinese American veteran. Um, and in every sense of the word, he is a warrior. Yeah. He's a warrior all the way, but he's also a great husband, a great Chinese American in the community who did many things uh, very quietly. And like I said, nobody knew his existence. It was incredible. And so the balance of this, David, I mean, we talked about you know, there's so many men that served, right? Obviously, right? Out of the 18,000 plus Chinese Americans that served in World War II, 40% of those were not citizens at that time, yet until after their military service, when they were able to obtain citizenship, the GI Bill, et cetera. Then you have roughly about two dozen women that served, right? And I, I wanted to really focus and give a little shout out to our first Chinese American woman pilot during World War II, Hazel Ying Li. And um, some of you may know that I also produced the film for PBS on her life story called um, A Brief Flight, Hazel Ying Li and the Women Who Flew Pursuit. And uh, we are about to do a new version of this uh, coming up in the next year. But Hazel is really worth mentioning because her journey starts during the Sino-Japanese War, and even before that, when she received her pilot's license in 1932. Um, as a native of Portland, of the Pacific Northwest, this was kind of the home of many Chinese-American early aviators. And Hazel had this idea that she was going to go into the Chinese Air Force with her girlfriend. And so in 1937, they decided to head over to China and try to join the Chinese Air Force, but it was not to be because the Chinese Air Force did not accept women, did not take them, and uh, Hazel was heartbroken. And furthermore, her friend who was also a licensed pilot from Portland, Virginia Wong, died in China of malaria, leaving Hazel very much alone. Um, and she was a bit lost, she didn't know what to do. She came back to New York City, stayed with a relative, and came into contact with none other than Sergeant Lao Sing He in, um, in, in New York City's Chinatown on Mott Street. And Lao Sing He kind of adopted her sort of like a goddaughter, found her a job working at the China War Relief Office at 555 Rockefeller Plaza, right? She works there kind of doing administrative work. She's bored out of her mind. She doesn't know what to do. And fortunately, the America enters the war December 7th, 1941. Pearl Harbor starts, okay? Then she starts to read articles on a U.S. women flying squad headed by Nancy Love at that time, which was a model off of the Royal Air Force, which basically took in women to help ferry aircraft. So she applied and got in, and the unit, the small unit, eventually merged with Jacqueline Cochran's Women Air Force Service Pilots, and she became the first to fly for America of Chinese-American descent. Um, Hazel flies for about two years, and unfortunately, in November 1944, she is involved in a major accident uh, when she's ferrying an aircraft from Buffalo, New York, to Great Falls, Montana. And in this, um, because of a faulty radio system, um, a plane lands on top of her, causing her to drop and explode into flames. And uh, about five days later, Hazel dies alone at the base hospital. And um, it's, it's a very, very heart-wrenching story because her family, a week later, receives a telegram that her youngest brother, Victor Ying Li, 
was killed in action in Europe. And so I have a little something to show to our audience. Um, I pulled this out of my archives. I think, I hope everyone can see this. It's, um, it's a very important piece of artifact um, from the Lee family because the two stars here, as Connie talked about during the war, you would hang a banner outside your door or your window to signify someone in your household is serving. And so these two stars represent Hazel and Victor. And this was given to the family by the local veterans of foreign war, Portland, Oregon, 520 Platte building. And it's written in pencil, Hazel Y. Lee and Victor Y. Lee. This was given to me by Hazel's younger sister, Frances, um, who has passed away. And this is one of the few items that actually signify both of them in service. Um, and I, I, I very much prize this piece because it's one of the few things from the Hazel Ying Lee family that, that survived that really signifies the both of them serving. Because some people don't even know that Hazel had a younger brother in the United States Army and he was an in infantry supporting an armored uh, battalion in, uh, in near Germany when he was killed in 1940, uh, 1944, uh, right out literally a week after Hazel dies. So, so that kind of puts in context, uh, as David, Connie, we discussed this idea about men and women serving our country, right, in World War II. And I really feel that these two individuals are really, truly powerhouses that, that basically gave their lives, right? Hazel gave her life uh, in, in, you know, for the country serving. Um, Rando, of course, is a very decorated combat veteran, much like your father who served in the China, Burma, India theater and saw heavy combat you know, towards the end of the war against the Japanese. So, so I think that putting all this in context again uh, for Veterans Day, um, we, we have to really give some credence to these individuals. We have to acknowledge these individuals for what they did for the country as Chinese Americans and also for the community. So as we come to in uniform for, and in uniform and on the home front. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And there's a big distinction there because we were active in both sides, right, of that uh, in the theaters of war and, of course, on the home front. So, David, I think um, safe to say that we can exit from the end of World War II to put in perspective again, we have returning Chinese American GIs, including a few women that were overseas coming back into the community. Um, Kanye knows this well. And this is where I feel that this is our high water mark. Coming back home, many of these men were able to attain their citizenship status when they did not have citizenship. They were able to get the GI Bill to further their education, continue college wherever they left off. And they were able to get better jobs, right? They were able to sort of modernize our Chinese American community for the long haul post-1946. Yeah. And I think this is a really important journey because if it weren't for these Chinese Americans that served during World War II, I fully believe that our community would not have grown by leaps and bounds after right. the war, right? Uh, that, that's kind of my personal feeling. And, and the fact that you know, many of these men also, they looked at their service as a stepping stone to their careers because a few of them, as you know, stayed on. And we'll talk about this as we enter Korea. So could um, David, mm -hmm. could you show the picture of the, of the Memorial Day Parade in 1951? And this was uh, for the dedication of the War Memorial at St. Mary's Square in San Francisco to Chinese Americans who gave the ultimate sacrifice in World Wars I and World War II. And this was, this was spearheaded by the American Legion, Cafe Post, and VFW in San Francisco. Uh, my father was one of, was a command, uh, uh, American Legion commander at that time in, when they were planning it. And then he was called to active duty in the Korean War. So uh, if we could have, have that picture, you can see that, um, um, it's it's a parade down on 
Stockton. Oh, Stockton. Uh, riding in the car. Yes, riding in the car. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. And um, I mean, it, if you look, there are photographs of the dedication day and it seemed like all of Chinatown was there at St. Mary's Square. And this is a parade and it was, it was a, I would say a, a very, um, a very serious parade in many ways because, you know, U.S. was at war again and um, there were Chinese Americans fighting in Korea. My father, there's my father. He was stationed in Oakland Army Base, um, Chief of uh, Inspections in the Ordnance uh, Division. And in the middle is Party Lo, who was a major in the reserves. And he was very important in the Rice Bowl, um, you know, fundraising and China relief during World War II. And then there's General Albert Wittemeyer, uh, who was who gave the a keynote address at St. Mary's Square for that the dedication, and he took over from Vinegar Joe uh, Stillwell as the, the chief of the uh, CBI, uh, the the war in China. So, so you have again. I mean, when you think about it, it's only what uh, five years after World War II, America's at war again, and this time. It's a war, it was a war against communism. And so this, the reason why there was such a, a fervor in, 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 um, in this, this Memorial Day to have a, this dedication, to have this plaque, to have this, this monument uh, to, to Chinese American soldiers in World War I and World War II who died fighting for our country to show we have play, paid in blood we have sacrificed, we are not the enemy. Because during this time, it was already the Red Scare. And there were, uh, FBI was having flyers in Chinatown saying, you know, su support suspicious activity, you know, to the authorities. Right. Again, you know, um, this was a, a, a time of the Chinese American community had to galvanize and fight again. Connie. David, this is, I mean, this is really important in the sense that right after World War II, we are getting ready for another conflict in Asia, right? Korea was really not even some, a place that not most people didn't even know about technically, okay? But the fact that Chinese Americans have to mobilize and some were recalled to duty from World War II, like Connie's father, there was also this question of loyalty, right? Because like Connie talked about, this was Red Scare. This was at the time when Chinese in Chinatown were being monitored, fingered, watched by the FBI for simply sending money back to China because they're supporting their relatives and, and, and extended family. But, you know, obviously the FBI didn't really understand that at first because it's, they, they look at it as something, whoa, they must be having communications with China. But this is where um, I had met a very, very important individual. And unfortunately, he, he passed too soon. This is none other than United States Major, United States Marine Corps Major Kurt Lee. And I had the honor of meeting Kurt Lee um, and working with him at the end because I was actually going to work with him on his biography. And it really pains me to know that unfortunately he didn't make it and he passed way too soon. But, but Kurt Lee is someone really worth mentioning because of his pride and because of his drive to become a Marine. He made it as an officer uh, during the Korean War, as we see, he went into action, uh, you know, very, very early on in the war in 1950. He basically fights against the North Koreans and, and as well as probably Chinese communist troops. And all that time, one of the major things that hung over his head was that his own company commanders and other Marines questioned his loyalty to say, 
wait, you're Chinese, right? You're kind of like one of the gooks they called, right? They called the, the North Koreans gooks. And, and their question was, could you do your duty and kill the enemy if you had to? And let's just put it this way. Kurt Lee was tenacious in combat. He was wounded. He fought hard. And he was also recognized with the nation's second highest honor, the Navy Cross. And that just kind of tells me that obviously he went full blast when the country needed him. He did his duty. He did, he did it well. He did not falter. And he was telling me that one of the things that he had to prove to his individual Marines was that, yes, he could hold his ground and he could fight and he could do probably better than some of the others. And he did that. And Major Lee told me um, that, you know, one of the things that a lot of people don't know, and I'm going to share this probably for the first time, is that he had a brother. His brother was in the army who was in the medical corps. And his brother was on the other side of the battle in which the army was fighting the North Koreans. And he himself was in the throng of battle and he was also wounded and he was also awarded the, the nation's second highest honor for the United States Army, the Distinguished Service Cross. So you have two Chinese American brothers fighting in the same campaign, one in the Marine Corps, one in the Army, and both were highly decorated. So I think that Money, question I'm, of loyalty. I'm, I'm sorry. So, and, and yes, forgive me if you already said this, but he was also the first um, Asian American to be uh, uh, commissioned as a regular officer, right, in the Marine Corps? Um, he, he, for, he is definitely the only one for Korea, but he oh, is yeah. not the first Chinese American in the uh, Marine Corps to be, to be commissioned. There was uh, one earlier commissioned in 1944. Okay. Um, so, so he is definitely, uh, in terms of a combat platoon leader, Mm -hmm. And being commissioned a lieutenant, uh, Kurt Lee is the first, I, you know, so, so, so it is very important that, that we have to mention him because as a combatant, um, he was in the thick of combat in Korea, obviously. And um, like I said, it's, it's uh, really a shame that, that he passed all too soon. And uh, I was working with him when he was living that time uh, in DC, David, um, and I already had plans to go out to see him and stay with him to work with him on getting his biography ready. And unfortunately um, he passed. And so that was never, um, that never happened. And so that definitely was something that I feel was uh, something lost. So we're going to try to do something at least to capture as much as we can working with his family, but um, it's not quite the same without the man there. So let's move forward, David, to um, our next conflict. And as we, and again, let me put in context for our audience. Um, so the Chinese American experience in Korea and then into Vietnam was, it was a lot less personnel than what it was in World War II. David, we just talked about this, as you know, because in World War II, we had over 18,000 that served. And Right when we get to Vietnam, um, I, I don't think we had more than perhaps 1,500 Chinese Americans that served because there are actually no official numbers. But um, I wanted to mention um, a remarkable veteran that I met in San Francisco um, when we basically had our uh, major exhibition earlier this year uh, at the Veterans War Memorial Building um, at the Veterans Gallery. Uh, it was wonderful at the American Legion's support. We were able to bring this, uh, this big event together for the first time to have this exhibition with artifacts and artwork and banners and everything. This is um, Private First Class. Um, um, our, our, excuse me, my, my head is spinning because I'm thinking about so many things here. So, um, so my friend um, here, uh, Mr. Louie, is a combat veteran from 1969 and Alfred Louis was a graduate of Galileo High School and he was a group he was with a group called the Galileo Boys and they're rightfully called that because from 1965 to 69 they were all drafted into service into Vietnam if that makes sense Alfred Louis supported um, 
uh, the um, Fifth Cavalry. He was part of the First Cavalry Division, and he saw a ton of combat in 1969. And, and after being wounded, he was sent home back to Fort Hood to recuperate. And he basically had nothing with him except for some medical um, clothing. And he kept his boots. And so when I met him during this event, um, we became close friends. And Alfred presented me with some of his surviving artifacts, including the boots. And I shot this picture of him in Chinatown one day when we were having lunch because I realized, again, nobody knew who he was. Our Chinese, our Chinatown community didn't realize that here was a Chinese American veteran from Vietnam that he really didn't share his story publicly. And again, didn't know his background, but here he was over 50 years later after the Vietnam War recounting his story because of our relationship and also because of this exhibition that we had in, in San Francisco to show Chinese Americans in the Vietnam War for the first time. And it was amazing to see him carrying his original boots um, you know, um, so many years ago. If you look at this picture, this is a remarkable picture too. You see Alfred is on the right side and he's the only Chinese American. But if you look at it, there are African-Americans, there are Caucasians. And this is basically almost like a scene out of the movie, Oliver Stone's movie, Platoon. And there he was in the thick, thick of the jungle, seeing combat in Vietnam and able to return home, thankfully, when his company took many, many casualties. And um, one of the things as a takeaway I learned um, because the Vietnam War was so different. Many of these men came home, whether you were Chinese, African-American or white, they came back to a country that was not very supportive of our military. Obviously the war was not popular. There was civil rights movements going on. Um, but one of the things that really hurt me when um, Alfred came home, you know, he told me that it was really bizarre to see people protesting against him, David. Um, people at the airport were shunning him, calling him names. Um, and, you know, obviously, you know, he was in uniform coming back home. And that is a very kind of bizarre situation as opposed to what we went through in World War II. Like these men came back and they were basically given a hero's welcome. But in Vietnam, it, it was so different, right? It was the fact that they were just looked down upon. And um, I remember him talking to me about how quickly he had to basically remove his uniform. And that, and for, for a while, he just couldn't talk about it. He didn't want to, he didn't want to show that he was actually a member of the United States Armed Forces at the time. You know, he went into I wouldn't say he was depressed, but let's put it this way. He had some form of PTSD that he had to deal with uh, after, after the war, coming home, coming back to a hostile environment in your, in your own town in, in San Francisco. So it took him many years to kind of live a quiet, secluded life, doing his thing, raising a family. But then eventually those, I guess you could say the ethos of war came back in his mind, right? Because he had friends that also went to Vietnam. He had part of the Galileo Boys gang, other Chinese Americans from San Francisco that then enlisted and joined and some were drafted. But the one thing that was really remarkable, David, was that at this event in San Francisco for our exhibition, it brought out all these veterans, the veterans that I had never known before, I, that I had not met. And it was incredible for them to come to say, We've never seen an exhibition like this, but we are touched and we, we want to share our story with you if you're willing to listen. And, and a lot and of this them is, have not even shared their stories with their own families. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and there's a, a few guys that actually got together at our exhibition and they hadn't seen each other for maybe a decade or longer, you know, and all of a sudden we became kind of a focal point for them to kind of come together in, in this reunion. And it's, it's really remarkable because the, the veterans are now known as, they're, they're probably our younger living veterans because most of our World War II veterans have passed. There are very few that are still with us, as well as Korea. There are very few Korea War veterans that are still with us. 
So the Vietnam generation is kind of that next group of guys um, that that really need to be recognized for their service, right? Um, and and then that also brings us to you know what happened after you know the Vietnam War because. If we start going into the 80s, right, let me frame this up. You know, we have Grenada, we have um, uh, Panama, we have Desert Storm, right, in 1990. And I have a rare report that was given to me by the U.S. uh, Veteran Affairs. Um, There was a a Japanese-American guy who worked on this um, survey that they interviewed uh, Chinese-Americans, Vietnamese-Americans, Filipinos, Koreans, and Pacific Islanders that served from Vietnam into Desert Storm. And the drop-off rate, uh, David, is, I mean, like, Chinese-American participation doesn't even register. And the largest amount uh, of Asians that served in that time period, believe it or not, were uh, Filipinos. Second was Pacific Islanders, you know, Fiji, Samoa, uh, Hawaii. And I, I it was safe to say, again, Chinese American participation has dropped off exponentially right into uh, Desert Storm, which leads us into our next veteran uh, friend, uh, Willem Wong. So he, he's going to take it on from here. Well, uh, I just want to tie in what you said about Sergeant Lao Sing Ki. So Sergeant Lao Sing Ki went you know, uh, basically moved to New York City after uh, World War I. And uh, he was actually instrumental in fi- find, um, forming the American Legion Post in New York City, Chinatown, the Lieutenant Benjamin Ralph Kim Lao Post. Now, the Lieutenant Benjamin Kim Lao Post was, was basically formed in 1945 through the instrumental efforts of actually Lao Sing Ki. Um, and so, you know, this is actually the first uh, Chinese American post named after a Chinese American veteran of World War II. Uh, so Benjamin Ralph Kimlau was a World War II bomber pilot that was killed over Papua New Guinea um, in support of uh, General MacArthur's push to, to take back the Philippines. Um, so there's other posts uh, in, in San Francisco, the Cathay Post, which was um, in 1931, it was formed in 1931. It's, it is the oldest post in the continental US, but the actual the oldest post is actually in Hawaii, mm-hmm. uh, the Cowtown Post 11, which has, I believe, been inactive since 2005. So the Kim Lao Post is actually, I believe, the largest with membership, 430 uh, veterans uh, since 1945 it was formed. So it's 77 years old. The Cathay Post is about 91 years old. And the, the Cowtown Post, if it's on name only, it's, it's about 94 years old. Um, so to move forward, um, speaking about um, you know my, my service since, and I joined in 1988, and I'm still serving in the Army Reserve at this point. So I, I actually been serving since uh, the end of the Cold War um, with President Reagan. So President Reagan was the president in 1988 when I joined in September. And when I got off active duty, on uh, November 9th, 1989, which some people may remember, this actually was the fall of the Berlin Wall. And I didn't realize that without looking at my discharge paper years later, that the, November 9th, 1989 was uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall. That's a photo of me uh, in, in uh, what they call jump school, airborne school in, in 1991. Uh, so that was, I, was, I did 12 years enlisted before I became an officer for the last 22 years. So, um, so my experience in, in the military from the last 34 years has been, um, I can't say, I can't outright just say that uh, I face any discrimination, but um, I must say that, you know, serving in Iraq in 2008, and then this photo is actually of my time in Afghanistan with two of my Afghan interpreters. The one to my immediate left is actually stateside in, in, in California, he's safe. And the other one has been able to uh, relocate from Afghanistan with his family to uh, Texas. So I'm happy that they both secure before, um, before you know, we withdrew from Afghanistan. And uh, unfortunately, you know, they still have other family members in Afghanistan 
which they are trying to um, try to evacuate out of, you know, obviously with, with the Taliban uh, pursuing them. Um, so um, going back to um, my time in Afghanistan, uh, you know, it was at that point I really, I realized that, wait a second, I, I noticed that when I got into Afghanistan with the Marines, I was actually on a special assignment with the Marines um, in 2011. And when I got to Afghanistan in February of 2011, months later, uh, a Lance Corporal Harry Liu was killed. And I didn't understand that. I said, okay, he's a Marine, was killed, but it was, it was self-inflicted, meaning it was a suicide. And then uh, I found he was related to Congresswoman uh, Judy Chu. And then six months later, uh, and, and I was in Afghanistan, you know, same time, um, in Kandahar, I was in Helmand Province. So Harry Liu was actually killed pretty close to where I was when I was actually stationed in Afghanistan. And then six months later, in October of, um, of 2011, a, a kid that grew up in Chinatown, New York City, Chinatown, that went to the same elementary school I went to, same junior high school I went to, and eventually he was aspiring to become a, a NYPD police officer, something I already did. Um, he killed himself too. It was basically with hazing incidents. I never experienced that myself to that extent when I was in the military, um, but I could see that it, it's, it can be prevalent because I hate to say it this way, um, sometimes when we live in, in our own Chinatown, wherever that might be in San Francisco, in New York City, to be Chicago, that we insulate ourselves sometimes and um, you know, you know, we don't take on the pressures of, of, of of uh, knowing how to negotiate with people of the backgrounds, and um, um, that's not the that's not to blame anyone. I'm just saying that we are not exposed, and they are not exposed to our um, you know our culture. So, I, you know, my my service has been mainly to educate other people about my background and my and my uh, cultural background. Even even most recently, before I went to Afghanistan. I was in an army uniform and people asked if I spoke English <laughs> and I basically said with a New York attitude, <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't want to say that out loud right now, but I basically said with a New York attitude and they basically said, whoa, okay, well, I know I speak better English than you, than you. so, but uh, eventually we reconciled when we were in Afghanistan and, you know, it, it, it took a moment for them to realize that, you know, I'm, I'm serving the same uniform you served in. And uh, we're on the same side, um, but it's unfortunate that um, that part of my my post, the Kim Lao post, is also to educate kids in the community that want to join the military. Right? We are not actively trying to recruit kids in the community to join the military, but if they do ever think about joining, them, please come to us first and understand that there's a different culture within the military, and that people may not see you the same way, you know in other parts of the country that, that they see you maybe in Chinatown or New York City, right? Because it's a melting pot. And well, melting do you feel like, do you feel like there's more acceptance as the years move forward uh, that you see in the military? Or do you feel like it kind of has ebbs and flow, you know, eb ebbs and tides? <clears throat> I, I look at, I, I look at the timeline of acceptance or tolerance more from from 1988 and then 1993, I think it was under Clinton, President Clinton, it was don't ask, don't tell, right? So uh, with, with people that are homosexuals, as long as you don't reveal that you're homosexual, you're, you can stay in the military, right? Back then, if you if you were admitted that you were homosexual or you're openly homosexual, you definitely will not be in. So don't ask, don't tell will still be, as long as you don't say that you're homosexual, you will not be booted, but if you can't be openly homosexual, then back, I think in, back in 2011, it was fully repealed where you could be openly gay and serve and it's okay. I think that timeline has basically, um, you know, expanded the tolerance of people. And I think that people are more accepting of people of different backgrounds, right? So whatever background you may, may, may be, I feel like that, that timeline is also very similar to how people accepted people of different cultures, right? Or different beliefs. And serving as long as you're willing to serve it was one team one fight so to speak mentality i feel like you know you you look i mean we did it all quickly in an hour but you know you look at the the depth of the history of 
Chinese serving in the military. And you would think that, you know, we would be at a point where you know, everybody put the uniform on, saw, you know, everybody is the same. But, you know, a lot of it is just that the history has been very squelched. It has, it's been underrepresented, it's been untold. And so if that history is not being told, then, um, you know, you're, you shouldn't expect that everyone would see everyone as the same, I guess. Well, I think one of the things that we talked about a while back is, you know, there are signs of recognition and acceptance, like, um, like the Congressional Gold Medal. Mm -hmm. um, yes. And, you know, that is something, I'll, I'm going to try to pull it up here. Um, it's hard, much harder operating the slides <laughs> than I originally thought it would be. Um, but, uh, you know, it's this has really been a significant milestone for telling this history. Um, you know, it doesn't, it's not a cure for everything that is, you know, has been missing or this history is not told, but, um, you know, it really is a step in the right direction. It's a great effort. Um, yeah, it just reminds me of um, when I was, when I met one of the Navajo cold talkers that they, they were recognized. And then years later, the Filipinos that served were recognized with a, a Congressional Gold Medal and now the Chinese American Congressional Gold Medal. So um, it, it has been going that way, right? Where, you know, people are being recognized for their service. Um, there was a question uh, about, are there any thoughts about a repository archive for military service members uh, military documents and memorabilia. Of course, as a museum, we always step forward and say we would love to be stewards of that. But, you know, I think it does, there are a couple layers to that. One, just as, you, you know, with whatever's in your family, step forward and preserve it, whatever you have within your family. Then, you know, there are stewards like Monty has a very extension extensive collection of, of material. And, you know, we have a growing collection as, as well. Um, you know, but find someone to be a steward of that, that memorabilia, because, um, you know, we, we, you don't, we can't, we can't really bear to, to lose the, that kind of history. Uh, I just want to add one more thing. So just last year, June of 2021, the New York City Landmark Preservation Commission designated the Kim Lau Memorial Post, War Memorial Post, named after our namesake post, a namesake by a post, uh, a, a New York City landmark. So that's the first time in New York City that a landmark that's tied to anyone of Chinese ancestry or culture has been designated with a landmark site. So I think that it has came to the point where, you know, it's being, we're being recognized for our contributions in different ways. And, you know, obviously our military contributions. So uh, David, I'd like to add one other thing. Um, about recognition. And um, Maya Lin, Chinese American woman, designed mm -hmm. the architect for the Vietnam Memorial in Washington, right. DC, which is a great symbol for our country, for a, a tribute to, to the fallen, uh, fighting an unpopular war. But also, it's a tribute to, um, to, to how, we, how we regard our people. You know, it's a, um, I think that when it was announced that, that she was the architect, people thought, what, what? it's like a perpetual foreigner, you know, <laughs> designed our American memorial and it became a teaching moment in many ways. So um, I think that it's, it's great that it's in Washington, DC and um, it's, it belongs to all of us. Absolutely. Yes. David, are there some questions? Uh, other questions coming through? Um, there are a lot of statements. Um, how can we continue to be an advocate for our community in this in the beautiful composition that makes up America? I think we were starting to to address that, but you know, if anyone has any additional thoughts for that, well, you know, the history that we're trying to perpetuate, the history that I'm trying to save. You know, with the work that I've done and continue to do, um, this is an eye opener because we were recently um, in New York City with Willem. Uh, I was giving several um, talks, especially to the JROTC program at Fort Hamilton High School. And thank you to um, 
Woolen for setting that up because it was really an eye opener to hear kids respond, right? These are 16 year olds, 17 year olds, 15 year olds in high school. And these are Chinese Americans. Uh, they are a part of a cadre of maybe 140 kids, I believe, Willem, that 30% of them are Chinese, which is pretty good numbers. And, you know, having a presentation given to these youngsters, um, watching the video, the, the congressional gold medal piece that I produced, which is a 10 minute kind of walk through about the Chinese Americans in World War II and why the congressional gold medal, and then discussing the local heroes like Sergeant Lao Sing He, I mean, it was really kind of an eye opener because the, the response from these kids were amazing, you know, to, to the point where I met one girl just signed up and she joined Navy the week prior. She said she signed her papers already to go in after her graduation. And then there was another um, young man who was a junior. Now, this kid was really interesting because his family are immigrants, first generation from Zhao, China. And he said to me, I've been talking to my parents about joining the military. My father is not okay with it, but my mother, but my father said that I just don't want you to join the United States military to fight China. And I thought that was like a moment, you know, it's, it's amazing. But he, but he had mindset on joining because he wants to support um, government so that he can go to school. Because my family cannot afford to send me to school. But if I go with the GDO support, I can go to college. And I just said, wow, that's pretty, pretty awesome that you've already kind of set your path to do this. I was very proud of them. And, and you know, the kid has one more year before he graduates, but he's, I think he's got a game made up, which I thought was wonderful. Yeah. So, so yeah, so it, it really depends to really teaching, making sure that our younger generation understands this history, right? And they can embrace yeah. it. Well, I think we are out of time. I think I think uh, what's clear is we could have several more of these uh, webinars with a whole different set of uh, of people to uh, to highlight. Um, so thank you to Mani, Mani Hom, uh, Willem Wong, Connie Yu, and thank you to Ron Chan at the Chinese American GI Project. Um, also, thank you to our team at CAMDC who's behind the scenes, Shinren, Annie Lai, Lai uh, Clarissa Chu and Ellen Fung. Um, if you're interested in supporting the Chinese American Museum or helping to make the service to country exhibit that we mentioned earlier a reality, uh, please visit our website, uh, www.chineseamericanmuseum.org. And thank you. And um, this event has been recorded. Everybody that's registered for this event will receive a link to our YouTube channel uh, where this will be. And we will also uh, send links to the organizations that were mentioned, uh, like the GI Project and um, any other resources that we can think of. So uh, good night, everybody. And uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. And uh, we will see you soon. Bye. Bye.